Uh, if you have your Bibles, will you turn to James chapter two? And we're doing things a little different today. I know you're saying, hey, we missed some music. We, we didn't get to worship yet. Uh, it's gonna come at the end. So don't worry, we're not leaving that part out. But we are continuing in our series in James and it's entitled Between Sundays. And uh, typically I like to kind of recap everything we've talked about and kind of go through the whole uh, reminding you of where we've been. I'm just gonna give you titles and then we're diving right into the message due to time today. But week one, we started with scoffer and servant. We, we learned about James, the author of James. Then we talked about trials and temptations. We talked about doers and hearers last week. And this week we're gonna be on mercy and judgment. So uh, again, I'm just gonna dive in. We can recap later. I would just encourage you, if you haven't already, please go read these five chapters. It's not gonna take you long, and we're gonna be here for a while, so it's probably good for you to kind of know where we're headed and know what we're gonna talk about. Uh, But as we dive in today, I do wanna take a little different approach. Usually, we read the scripture, and then we kind of break it down and and piece by piece and talk about it. We're gonna do that, but I actually wanna give you a little bit of the, the gist behind what James is saying before we even read it. I want you to look for some things as we're talking about mercy and judgment, I believe we all know what judgment is. It's very easy for us to judge others, to see a person and go, well, they're this based on what we see. We're very quick to judge. But I wanna be clear on what mercy is before we dive in. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown to a person who it's within our power to punish or harm. We're showing compassion or forgiveness to someone who we have the very power to punish or harm. Mercy sounds somewhat like grace. So I wanna give you the difference. They're not the same. Mercy is the act of withholding deserved punishment, right? You're holding something back that you could give while grace is the act of giving unmerited favor, okay? Let me say that again. Mercy is the act of withholding deserved punishment while grace is the act of giving unmerited favor. Think of it like this when we're thinking about God. In his mercy, God did not give us punishment that we deserved. Can you say amen to that? He did not give us punishment we deserved. We don't go to hell because we don't have to because of his great mercy. But it's with his grace, God gives us the gift that we do not deserve, which is heaven. Right? So that's the difference between mercy and grace. Grace, And our scripture is gonna talk about how mercy triumphs over judgment. Giving compassion and forgiveness to someone who doesn't deserve it triumphs over taking something and believing something about someone that isn't true or putting them in a category that just based on what you see. So James, in his normal, uh, direct manner, is going to really tell us four things in the scriptures we're gonna read. Chapter two, verses one through 13, we're gonna look for four things. Number one, the what. We're looking for the what. It's in verse one. Based on eternal, external circumstances, we are not to show favoritism. That's the what. So if you're a note taker, you've got bulletin there. They're, they're right there on it. You can follow along that way. Uh, the what, James chapter two, verse one. Then he's gonna talk about the why behind the what. Why should we not do this? Well, it's in verses four and five that we're gonna find the why behind it. Verses nine through 11, he's gonna give us the consequences when we do show favoritism or when we do judge others and we judge more than mercy. And then verse 13, we're gonna get the good news. So knowing that, let's begin reading James chapter two, verses one through 13. Here we go. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. There's the what, don't show favoritism. Now he's gonna go hypothetical. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. So again, he's been speaking hypothetical. Now he's gonna direct it to those who have the problem. Look at verse four. He's going right at him. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? And to inherit the kingdom, he promised those who love him. 
but you have dishonored the poor. It is, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing right. So he's gonna give us the right answer here. He's gonna tell us what we should be doing. Love your neighbor as yourself. But look at verse nine. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And then he concludes with mercy triumphs over judgment. You ever hear the statement like attracts like? Or maybe the the statement, you are who you hang out with? The reason those statements are true is because we tend to gravitate toward those who look, act, talk, think like us. It's a natural thing for us to be drawn to those kinds of people. It takes me back to high school. I had to go to a new high school my junior year um, and in Springfield, Missouri, I don't know how many students were. There were about 450 in my class alone. So it was freshmen through seniors, that many kids having lunch. I remember walking in that very first day, I can still picture the cafeteria and going, okay, where do I sit? Because if I pick the wrong table, then I'm placed in with those people. You remember those tables in high school? You had the jocks sitting at one table, the really smart people, some people called them nerds, sitting at one table. I remember in in my era, the the goth people, they dressed in all black. Do you remember those people? You guys know what I'm talking about or is it just me? Okay, so you were there. Yeah, you went to the lunchroom and knew that, man, you were really saying something when you sat at a certain table because you're saying, I'm in with these people. And you didn't wanna be totally judged by that. You didn't wanna be in the wrong crowd or man, that was like, you know, just you ruined your whole social life by doing this. And here we're seeing that the people who are easy to hang out with, it's very easy to go to those people because man, we like them. We talk about the same things, we think alike. So it's very easy to drift towards those, those people. And if we're not careful, when we're talking about this idea of favoritism or showing partiality, We could be tempted to think this seems trivial compared to some of the sins and temptations that we deal with in this world. Really, Chad, we're gonna talk about, you know, favoritism? But James is telling us this is as great as any other sin. And he's trying to force us out of our comfort zone, out of just going to those people that are easy and not showing favoritism based on what we see. He says we're to love everybody, not just the lovely or the desirable. And we know the Bible commands us to love everybody, but usually that comes with some exemptions, we think. We've got it in our mind. I should love everyone, but that person kind of wears me out. I'm to love everybody, but I don't totally agree with how they live their life. So I'm gonna distance myself from certain people. So I've got these exclusions. No, no, the command is that we love everyone. So the what is don't show favoritism. Why? Why should we not show favoritism? Well, let's look at verses four and five. Why is it? Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Now, this sounds really familiar. I've heard this before. Just a week or two ago, we talked about how similar James is to Jesus when he was speaking his Sermon on the Mount and how James really reinforces a lot of those things. Hear this again. He says, has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? Now, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the what? Kingdom. He's reinforcing the very thing Jesus said. So why is it always easy to give the what, but it's harder to give the why? It's harder to figure out the why. We want the why, 
Let me give you an example. How many times did your parents tell you to do something? They gave you the what, and you said why, and their response, the most least favorite response in all the world, because I said so. You know where I'm going. That's not why. It should be good enough, but it's not why. I wanna know the why behind it. When I tell my kids to clean their room and they say why, it's very easy to just go, because I said so. But they wanna know the why behind it. Why do I have to clean my room? Then I have to go into it. I don't wanna see your clothes all over the floor. I don't want mice gathering where you have all those wrappers under the bed. I don't want, I'll give you $5 later, I promise. I don't want... <laughs> I wanna teach you to pick up after yourself. I want you to care about things so that you'll be a good employee, so that you'll live a good life and care about things as you get older and then you won't be jobless and living in my basement. That's the why. (laughs) Or I could just say, because I said so. It's a lot easier to just say that. But we want the why behind it. James, he's, he's saying don't show favoritism based on outward appearance, based on what you see, based on how you judge somebody. So why shouldn't we? It's because you're dishonoring your heavenly father and it is not Christ-like. That's the why behind it. It's the opposite of the gospel message. Because the gospel message says that Jesus has broken down every barrier, whether Uh, Cultural, racial, economic, or religious, doesn't matter. They're broken down. He came for everyone. Now, we went back to high school just a moment and talked about the difficulty in the lunchroom. I remember middle school, even leading into high school. And when I got out of school, I ran home. We lived in a, a neighborhood, you know, like most of you probably did. There were kids that just, you didn't go home and like, you know, sit on the video game and go, I'm bored, what do I need to do? No, we went outside and we created things to do. You know what I'm talking about? So I can't tell you how many pickup games of football we had in the backyard or basketball. And I remember there was this empty uh, concrete pad in the back corner of our yard when I was little. And my grandparents for Christmas one year, they decided to get us a basketball goal to go with that concrete pad. So I called my mom this week and I said, hey, do you have any pictures? I remember seeing pictures of this. So if you don't mind, can you throw that picture of, uh, of us putting up this basketball goal? Do you have that? You don't have it. Okay, well, we won't show that. There was this basketball goal that they put up for us. Well, just like any neighborhood, when kids see something new in someone's yard, what do they do? Whoosh. I mean, that's where they go. So we started having these basketball games, right? With pickup games. And what do you always do when you're gonna do that? Whether it's football, basketball, whatever it is, you're gonna get everybody out there and the two dominant players, the two best, they're gonna be team captains. And what do you do? You start picking. I'm picking the best team. I want the fastest, the tallest, the best. I wanna get the winning team. And we're picking those. And then there's last kid. You remember the last kid, his shoes are untied, he's picking his nose, looking at birds. I mean, he doesn't know, he don't even know what you're playing, right? He's just there, we'll take that guy, right? You know what I'm talking, some of you were that guy. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. That's the opposite of what James is saying. Actually, this is not how God works and aren't you thankful? Because if we're thinking about God's team, if we were basing his, on, his team on the best and most talented, smartest, wealthiest, most knowledgeable, some of us wouldn't make the cut, right? But then there's some of you sitting out there going, mm, Chad, I don't know, I'm looking around. I think I would be the team captain. I, I think I'm that guy. You know what, you're, you're ruining this whole sermon right now. The whole idea is to not judge people. And you're sitting there going, I'm better than all these people. What are you thinking? Jesus reached through these social barriers and he rescued the weak and the lowly. And as we read the gospel, we find that often the smartest, wealthiest, most knowledgeable, most religious people were those furthest from the kingdom of God. Think about it. The ones that made Jesus the most angry. The ones he preached at the most. So the question might not be to ask, who's the most knowledgeable? Who's the most successful? I think the question we might wanna ask ourselves, if we wanna be on God's team, hey, when's the last time you led someone to Christ? 
When's the last time you discipled someone? How, how good are you at last week's being a doer of the word and not just a hearer only? See, it's when we realize that we're not all that in a bag of chips that we begin to understand that we need God in our life. Two weeks ago, we talked about the trial and how the trial reminds us of how inadequate we are without Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter one, you don't have to turn here, I just wanna read it to you. It's a good reminder of what I'm talking about. Verses 26 through 29, and this is Paul talking, and he's gonna say brothers and sisters. He's gonna talk to us just like James did. He says, think of what you were when you were called. Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and things that are not to nullify the things that are. Why? So that no one may boast before him. See, when we show partiality, we're not honoring God. When we're showing favoritism, when we're drawn to certain people and we're leaving other people out, what we're doing based on what we see, we're stepping out from under God's grace and we begin to view things from our perspective instead of his. We're not seeing people as Christ sees them, we're seeing them as we see them. And that's where James is coming right at us. So look at verse six. This is when he gets real direct. You have dishonored the poor. Now, don't get caught up in rich or poor here. That, uh, yeah, that's what James is saying, but this could be uh, any scenario of where we wind up judging people. But he says, you've dishonored the poor. It is not the rich, excuse me, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they, they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? What James is really saying is, we crave attention from those we think are important. We seek their approval, and we're quick to throw our time and energy into those who are deemed important by us. And we're quick to brush off those who seem like a burden to us. Well, we're annoyed by that person. And that person was made in God's image. So if we're not careful, out of a desire to feel accepted, out of a desire to feel like you're in the right crowd, we will sell out our brother to buddy up to the world. The same world that belittles us, the same world that mocks us, the same world that attacks us, we will sell out our brother in order to buddy up to the world. Just so we can say we're relevant. This reveals a heart issue. Remember, Jesus gave his life for the rich, the poor, the somebodies, and the nobodies. And we are to pour out our lives in service to anyone made in God's image. The message of Christ is for all to come. And how sad would it be is if we as the church reject those who seem too far, too sinful, too different from us, and we reject them. We're basing it on what we see, not on what Jesus sees. So let's look at verse eight. We get the right answer, we know what we're supposed to do, but James is gonna tell us, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, then you're doing right. That's what we're to do. Just love your neighbor as yourself. Again, some people, I'm not gonna lie to you, some people are easier than others. Some people are a lot harder than others, right? That doesn't mean we just shun them. That doesn't mean we push them away. He tells us the right thing to do. That just means to love those around you. He never said, hate the rich and love the poor, you know, and just take it the opposite. No, he said, love everyone. Show partiality to no one. So we know the what. Don't show favoritism. Don't show partiality. Why? Because it's dishonoring to God and you're not representing Christ well when you do that. So let's talk about the consequence. Look at verses nine through 11. Here's the consequence. If you show favoritism, you sin. 
It's right there at the beginning. If you show favoritism, you sin, and you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. So if you do not murder, excuse me, commit adultery, but you do commit murder, then you have become a lawbreaker. Now, here's kind of how I see this scenario going. As we're reading this, when we're talking about lawbreakers, excuse me, uh, murderers and adulterers, some of us, we're coming to church, we're hearing this and we go, you know what, I'm here, I'm worshiping God, I sing to the songs, I knew every one of them this morning. We haven't even sang yet, except for one, so hopefully you knew that one. You say amen every once in a while because it sounds good. You might remember a line of the sermon to use later in small groups so you can sound smart. And then when we begin to talk about this, you're going, man, I've never murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. So I must be doing pretty good compared to those who are dealing with this. And here's James saying, no, you didn't murder. You didn't cheat on your spouse. But if you show favoritism, you're breaking the law. You sinned against God. And God knows that we're not able to keep the law perfectly. He knows that all sin and falls short of the glory of God. But even though he knows that, he still commands us to be those who do not show partiality and extend mercy. He still commands it. He's looking for progress, not perfection. He's looking that we're growing in that, that we are being doers of the word and not just hearers only. He's not looking for perfection because we're not perfect people, but there should be progress along the way. I'm reminded again of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. There's two ways of looking at this. When you hear that, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. That means that I can just go through life going, man, I better give some mercy today so if I need some later on, I'll, I'll get it. That's like saying, well, I better give in the offering today so I can hopefully get something back from God. That's not the heart behind that. No, we are to show mercy, and when we do, we're gonna be blessed with mercy, but it's not that we're just looking to trade out. I know I'm gonna need some mercy. Like, I've been working out with Ryan Lessman, right? I told him what we were gonna be talking about this week as I'm working out, and I said, if I don't say anything bad about you on Sunday, will that mean you won't make me do anything too hard next week? (laughs) So Ryan, just to be clear, I didn't throw you under the bus on anything. Looking for mercy this week. Actually, what if it means... What if it means that by extending mercy to others, when we are merciful, what if it actually means we're revealing that we have already received mercy? Think about that. That we're not doing it just so we can get some back, but we're revealing what God has done in us. The love that we have received, the mercy that we have received causes us to want to extend that same thing to others. So let's close out. Last two verses. Verses 12 and 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. You know what I hear in that? I hear last week's be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Do what it says. Don't show favoritism. That's really what he's saying here. Why? Here's another why. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. But then we get the good news. The good news is the last three, four words, excuse me. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's the good news. When James says mercy triumphs over judgment, he's not speaking of our human mercy. He's speaking of the mercy of God. God's mercy triumphs. The gospel triumphs. If God wanted to judge us without mercy, we're all doomed. He could totally do it. Remember the the definition. It's one who has the ability or the power to do something to someone, but they don't, they hold it back. And that is our heavenly father. If he wanted to judge us without mercy, we're done for. Which reminds me of Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. 
It says this, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, our God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses. And then the word grace comes in. It is by grace you have been saved. The reason we need to hear this morning, hear this this morning, the reason we need to know this is because when you fail, when you mess up, we find mercy at the cross. And when you begin to recognize how wonderful that mercy is, how powerful that mercy is, how much of that mercy we need, the goal is that you will begin to extend that same mercy to those around you. Not to judge them based on how they live their life, how they spend their money, how they dress, how they whatever. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, sometimes I would imagine, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm always up here, I'm, I'm not down there, but sometimes I think you probably come in sometimes and you maybe the message is specific, you know, directed like mercy and judgment, but maybe sometimes you're like, oh good, I get a free pass today. This is on blah and I don't have a problem with that. So I can just relax and this is perfect for so-and-so, but it, it won't be for me today. This is not that sermon. I truly believe this is a message for every single one of us in the room today. That mercy triumphs over judgment. It's very easy to give judgment. It's very easy to wanna just throw that at somebody and think something and let our minds go there. It's a little harder to extend mercy. But who said the gospel was easy? Will you bow your heads with me? I love these testimony videos. I love hearing the stories of others who have had a struggle in some way and God delivered them out of that. And I love hearing stories of like Shay and Shane who were drugs and alcohol and prison and God delivered them from all of that and they've received that mercy and accepted that grace but can I tell you what I like just as much I love those testimonies but, but what I like just as much is to, to see a what I would call a self-righteous Christian who recognizes for years I've been judging others based on where I was for years, I've been measuring my life by those around me. I've been calling myself a Christian a long time, but I'm recognizing that I've not been extending that mercy. I've actually just been measuring up, saying, how do I do to them? Well, I must be better than them. Well, look at how they live their life. God, where am I at compared to them? Maybe you recognize today that Without God's grace and God's mercy, you were doomed. Realizing that mercy received causes us to show that same mercy to others. The what? Don't show favoritism. Don't show partiality. Why? It's not God honoring. The consequence, we sin. Just like any other sin, we sin just by doing that. We think it's not a big deal, but it actually is something in our heart. There's a problem there. And God is here to say, I love you. And I have all the mercy that you need. I have all the grace that is sufficient for you to be forgiven today. Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Father, thank you so much that you don't judge us. You have every right to, you have every opportunity to, you know more about us than our own spouse, than anyone else, you know us better than we know ourselves. But Lord, out of your great love and your mercy, you sent your son to die on a cross for us.
Father, may that be so real in us. May that become so alive in us that we can't help but extend that same mercy, that we would see everyone the same. That we would love everyone, no exclusions. No, well, God, you know how that person gets on my nerves. Pray that you would speak to our hearts today. Challenge us in those moments where we wanna judge, God, that we would be willing to extend mercy. We'd be willing to love all of those around us. Okay, I'm done. Now it's now it's your turn to talk to God. I've prayed a prayer. Now I want you to have the opportunity to do the same. Let God hear from your heart today. feel like sometimes I have the unfair advantage because I know where we're headed. I know what we're talking about today. And as I've been thinking about this all week, one thing keeps coming back to my mind and that's gratitude. Just gratitude. Knowing how many times I mess up, knowing how many times I wanna see something on social media and go, why'd they post that? How many times in my own heart that I deal with this and it brings back gratitude to say, God, thank you that you don't judge me the way I judge. Thank you that you see us truly as we are. And then, then with that gratitude comes that desire to be more like him, to say, God, I gotta do better. I gotta change something in me that when my heart wants to go there that I stop it and say, no, no, I need to extend mercy. So I would just encourage you, don't forget to be grateful for what God has done for each and every one of us. But in that same way, as that gratitude comes, that should be an encouragement to go, okay, now it's my turn. When those opportunities come and your heart wants to go the wrong direction, wants to lead towards judgment, I just pray that you would extend mercy. God, will you help us to do that this week? God, help me. Every one of us in this room, God, to just be led by you, by your example. And we are grateful for all that you have done. God, I pray that that challenges us to grow and to change every day. In Jesus' name, amen.